Middle Podcast. The podcast dedicated to the music, movies, and culture of Generation X. What is up, Slackers, and welcome to another episode of the Stuck in the Middle podcast. I am your host, Jason Eck, and I have to tell you that this week is another one of those whatever Wednesdays, and I'm going to explain a little bit for anyone who hasn't listened to the show before what exactly is a whatever Wednesday. It is I don't have a particular topic, but a bunch of little topics here and there, and in part because... It's been a rough couple of weeks. So this first part of the show, what I typically do is I kind of tell you what's going on. So um, I'm going to be very honest, going to be very candid that I, I have had some sudden health issues. Now, I've mentioned on the show before that I have Crohn's disease and it's basically been under control for the most part, for a number of years now. And you also know, if you've listened to the show, that I have been actually focusing on my overall health, wellness, and fitness. Down 25 pounds and working towards a goal of 30. So to have what has happened happen now is really discouraging because I was making a lot of positive progress both mentally, physically, and spiritually. And getting to this point of middle age, that becomes more and more, I think, important, or at least it has been to me. And I know some of the feedback that I get from, you know, you, the listeners, kind of mirror that back of, of what, we're, what we're experiencing at this phase of our lives. And I will admit, it, it has thrown me for a loop I will tell you that sometime in the coming weeks, it's likely not guaranteed, but likely that I'll have to have some form of surgery. Now, those with Crohn's disease are fated to have at least one surgery, if not multiple surgeries throughout their lives. This is something I I bear a little bit of a burden with, knowing that my youngest son also has Crohn's. However, he's begun treatment very early. And it hasn't done any of the things that have been concerning. So, for example, getting onto some heavy duty treatments could, in fact, impede growth. He is six one and growing, um, very active, very physically fit, eats anything he wants, and very little repercussions. Um, but I think what's happening is that the the situation that I'm faced with, which is a series of infections and complications, I had a similar thing. Almost, well, it's technically 11 years ago, 11 years ago. And I find that when you have a situation like this, I'm just speaking for myself, that you sometimes get transported mentally into that time and space. And I remember how difficult it was then at the time when this happened for the first time. And, you know, I'd already had Crohn's disease at that point for, let's see, uh, 18 years or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I'm doing my best not to find myself back in that mindset because I'm a different being than I was then. So just to tell you what had happened back then was that we were on a family vacation. I hadn't been feeling great and I had been driving across the state for my job every day long days. Sometimes I just stayed at work. I worked for a hotel company, so I just slept at the hotel some nights. So there was a period of time where I wasn't seeing my kids very often, except for on the weekends. Um, We go up to Santa's Village. We did a few years at Storyland and went up to Santa's Village. For anyone who doesn't know, that's up in New Hampshire uh, in the White Mountains and just fun stuff for little kids. It's, It's scaled amusement parks for kids. And the first day we were there, we met some of our friends up there. Uh, one of them was a doctor. One is a scientist. Well, they both still are doctors and scientists. And we went for a dip in this beautiful lake, beautiful lake with the mountains in the background, gorgeous. There's mountain climbers. You can see them, you know, from a distance. 
and went into that lake. And when I got out, I couldn't get my body temperature regulated at all. And I was freezing cold. And this is the start of the trip. So we have a whole day at the park. And then we go to our hotel. We got this room with a loft. I remember it clearly. And then I just spent the whole night tossing and turning and sweating. And just now I'm just, I'm just boiling, right? Well, I get up in the morning. We go to have breakfast. Our friend is the doctor. She goes, you have some kind of infection. You have some kind of issue going on. And wouldn't you know, by the time that that weekend was over and I got back home, I was very, very ill, very, very ill. And it just got worse from there. And I was too late to really catch it in time. So this resulted in severe complications. So here I am all these years later, thinking I'm in great shape. I'm, I'm getting physically fit, eating right, and mostly, mostly eating right. And to have this happen at a time where it's also my busiest week of the year at work is this week. So there's also high stress going on, and this happens. So I'll be honest with you. I had a couple of things that went through my head. So one is this notion of despair, feeling this sense of despair, and that I could find myself going down into that place. And it just so happens that for whatever reason, my wife and her sister were having a similar conversation about despair. And I'd mentioned that my mother-in-law hasn't been doing particularly great, and she's been feeling really down and just some major health issues there. And they were reminded of all places. I never saw this show or movie or whatever it is. So uh, I just, it escapes me. But Anne of Green Gables, I bet you did not expect me to say anything about uh, Anne of Green Gables tonight. But apparently, um, Anne is saying to like the caretaker woman or something to that effect that she's deep in the depths of despair. And the woman kind of gives her the side eye glance or the smirk and like, no, can't possibly be. Into, oh, yes, I'm in the depths of despair. Haven't you ever been in the depths of despair? She goes, no, I don't believe I have. You've never been in the depths of despair. And the woman's response was to despair is to turn your back on God. Now, for those of you who are not into any kind of religion, you might be like, oh, that's not all that powerful. But the concept of despair is turning your back on God, meaning that you have no faith, no belief that things are going to get better, etc. And you're allowing yourself to wallow in your own self-pity. Thus, your despair is not a mindset that I need to be in right now. Excuse me. However, the other thing that went through my mind was, I don't know if this podcast can continue. And that's a sobering thought. And maybe I'm just not in the right mindset. But I will tell you that the things that I get for positive feedback also tend to be the thing that makes it the most challenging, which is it's just me and a microphone and my own thoughts, my own research. It's just me for an hour. That is remarkably both difficult, but when I get going, it can be really easy. But trying to keep things relevant, keep things interesting, but also knowing there's only so much maybe that I could do, or it's these deep dives into particular subjects that do take a tremendous amount of work when I am trying to live the rest of my life in in positive ways. So I'm just going to put this out there. So my wife says to me tonight, so Maggie, who's been on the show, she goes, don't make that decision yet, particularly now with this mindset and reminding me, you know, the things that you haven't done that you could do recognizing the amount of work that it takes to do it. And, and primarily it's the social media stuff, but it's also video video tends to be much more popular, or at least allows people to get eyes on it in a different way where YouTube is less effective for just pushing out the podcast, right? Because it's all audio, but it's a video driven kind of medium. But the actual editing of video is so much more labor intensive than it is doing my audio. Now, one of the key things is the platform that I use, StreamYard, always puts things off by about a half a second for the uh, the video to the audio. So that always requires work. 
to get it synced and then any kind of subsequent edits that I do, I have to be very cautious about where I cut it to make sure that I don't lose the continuity in audio. So that in of itself is a challenge. But I'm telling you right now that I'm, I'm not prepared to pull the plug. However, I may be reaching out to a couple of you. I know many people who listen to the show also do podcasts and also some of my former guests. And I get the difficulty to wanting to commit to a regular co-hosting gig for a show. I get it. But I am thinking it would be kind of cool to have a regular rotating group of co-hosts. Some of you have podcasts. I've listened to your podcasts, and I know what you could bring to the table. Also, similar sensibilities, mindsets, etc. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep coming back week after week. So if you get a DM or a message from me, um, and you would be interested in even just doing a, a run-through, a meet-and-greet on StreamYard or Zoom or something like that, just to shoot the shit and see if maybe it works. Because here's what I do know. Sometimes podcasts... That's how it starts with people who have never worked together before, who just so happen to get into a room or get onto a social media platform or whatever it is, and magic happens. And I would love to keep the show rolling. I'd love to see the show grow. Frankly, it's it's very much at a plateau. It's been in a plateau for a while. And some episodes hit and people will listen to it, but they don't necessarily come back. And I look at the analytics of the people that I add and I, and I lose, but anyway, it's been a, it's been a trying time. I mean, it really has been, and I have so much going on over these next couple of weeks to have an illness or a complication from a chronic illness kind of rear its head right now has made me kind of rethink a lot of things and how do I want to proceed with the podcast, but also how am I going to proceed on a health journey when I now have this stumbling block that's going to take weeks, months, and if it's at all similar to what I faced the last time with this similar situation, it could take years before it resolves. I'll tell you, it took years uh, on a particular medication that they desperately wanted to get me off of. And I've been off it for two years, and here we are having this situation occur but very, very taxing for the liver. And anyway, I needed, I needed to get off of it. It was good that I did, did have some liver abnormalities that thankfully to my weight loss have been resolved, but yeah, it's been, it's been tough and I want to keep the show going, but I definitely need some other voices. And I think that will help the podcast to have some other voices on the show. So Keep an eye out for messages. And like I said, if I had rotating rotating cast members, if you will, we're looking at maybe once a month. Once a month, get on here, do an episode, usually around a particular topic. And I think it would be great and get some different perspectives other than just my own. Because I could go down the routes of, of least resistance. Least resistance means I could convert this more into a, man, you don't, you don't, I don't want to do a politics show. I don't, I could go down that road and know that people get into that shit and maybe I'll do a separate podcast, but I have always maintained that this show is for everyone, regardless of what your background beliefs are. I'm sure there. Are, I've said some things that people are going, I'm never listening to that again. That guy said X, Y, and Z, reading between the lines. He must mean this. He must mean that. That's fine. That's okay. I can't keep everyone. But I don't want to be like a single subject like that because there's already enough things that are just angst-driven. And hell, politics is just one of those areas that, holy shit, I, I... I'd probably enjoy doing it for my own sense of catharsis and just getting it out there, but that's not fun to me. I'd rather talk about music, movies, and culture on a very fun level of, of retro, nostalgic, good times, good vibes, 
That's what I'm going for. That's what I'm sticking with. So that's where we're at with the podcast. I ain't pulling the plug yet, but on a little bit of life support and reaching out for a little bit of a lifeline. So like I said, be looking for someone once a month, some rotating cast members, easy lift for you, more of a hard lift for me because the editing for multiple members, multiple people usually requires a lot more editing, but I'm absolutely willing to do it to keep the show going and alive. So for those of you who pray or meditate or whatever it is that you do, you want to just send some, some well wishes and some prayers my way. I will happily take them. I will do the same for you because I could use them all to get through this time period. So thank you. So whatever Wednesday, that means I can talk about whatever jumps into my stupid little mind. And man, I'm kind of all over the place, which seems about right, given everything. So first thing I have here, first topic for the evening. I just like to once in a while pop in. Okay, so this one's all, this is heavy. This is heavy, but I guess it kind of goes along. It's the perfect segue, health into health. That's what we're looking at here. Um, this is really, that was weird. Okay. Anyway, so, um, health into health. I put in a search Gen X in the news and wouldn't you know it, August 5th, just a couple of days ago. What does it have as a headline? The 17 cancer types are more common in Gen X millennials as study notes, alarming trend. Diet and lifestyle changes could be key to reducing younger onset cancer, says oncologist. So, Gen X, these are not the uh, uh, greatest sets of, of news to be given. However, researchers found that the prevalence of small intestine cancer, believe me, it freaks me out with Crohn's disease, of small intestine cancer, kidney cancer, and pancreatic cancer was two to three times higher and those born in 1990 than those born in 1955. Oh, so that's actually millennials are getting hit with that part. And then for us, oh, good grief. Um, yikes. Breast cancer, uterine cancer, colorectal cancer, non-cardiogastric cancer, gallbladder cancer, ovarian cancer, testicular cancer, anal, anal cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, and other cancers that are more prevalent in younger groups, including myeloma, leukemia, cardiogastric cancer, and other non-HPV-associated or pharyngeal cancer. Death rates also rose among younger groups for liver cancer, in females in particular, gallbladder cancer, uterine cancer, testicular cancer, and colorectal cancer. Oh, man, this is... I, I only read, like, the, the high-level thing, but... Cancer has historically been associated with aging, yet doctors have seen an alarming trend of surging cases among those under 50 years of age. Well, great, I'm, I'm over it. I'm over, I'm over 50, right? Oh, Just gets worse. Um, this latest trend indicating increases in early onset cancer is a paradigm shift. It is vital that we identify the reasons behind this trend, educate the public, advance prevention and early diagnosis, and develop more effective treatments. There's considerable evidence pointing to environmental causes of early onset cancers. We cannot deny that an extensive range of environmental factors have rapidly transformed in developing countries since the mid 20th century. And let's be honest, food, man, caring for our gut's microbiome, the internal mechanism responsible for absorption of vitamins, regulation of the immune system and assistance with food digestion is essential. And then avoid ultra processed foods we're working on it in my house exercising prevent obesity working on that avoiding avoiding smoking i can't kick it just yet i know it's stupid god i love it so much and then finally alcohol consumption not a problem done did it so i guess with everything that i'm currently facing this makes this even more I think appropriate and just kind of a, a reminder for 
any of you or for any of us who may be maybe lacking in a couple of these areas, there is no time like the present. I could be like, oh, well, I've been trying to do everything right. Yeah, I still get sick. Yeah, you might. You might. That that's that happens. But why not reduce the risk factors as much as you can? And that includes don't be a dope like me. Quit smoking cigarettes. Quit drinking alcohol if you're incapable of being moderate about it. And try not to eat all the shitty food, even though in a time where inflation is crazy high, food can be super expensive particularly if you want to eat right. So we are talking about going ahead and doing a garden. My daughter says she's all gung-ho. Let's do it. Let's do it, Dad. We'll do it. We'll do it right now. We're going to make tomato plants. I don't know why that's my impression of my daughter. It sounds nothing like her. Um, but they're like, hey, we'll do tomatoes, and we'll do cucumbers, and we'll do it all ourselves. And finally, after years of trying to convince my wife that I wanted to go down this road, we're talking about chickens. Chickens. Old ECW reference for anyone knows. That is um, Roadkill, the angry, the angry Amish assassin. We just look at the camera and pretend like he was wringing the neck. Chickens. Anyway, focus on your health, people. Focus on your health. Do it. Do it now. Next, oh, are all my articles just kind of bleak? See, this is the mindset. This is the mindset I've been in, honestly. Oh, man. Yeah, I forgot I pulled this one up. And some of you might say, no shit, Sherlock. Half of boomers and Gen X are poised to run out of money in retirement, but millennials seem to be in a better spot, says report. An astounding 45% of American households are projected to run short on money in retirement, according to a new report. But the shortfall isn't uniform across households. In fact, younger generations may actually be better prepared for retirement than their parents. Now, this is a recent article, but I am somewhat surprised by that because I'm hearing a lot from millennials and, and family millennials that maybe this isn't the case, but... Uh, the biggest would be that younger generations appear to be in a better position than older ones. Despite the pervasive storyline that millennials will never be able to afford to retire, Morningstar reports that 47% of Gen Xers and 52% of baby boomers may experience retirement shortfalls, compared with 37% for Gen Z and 44% for millennials. That's primarily because young boomers and Gen Xers were at the forefront of the shift away from pension plans towards self-funded retirement savings. This means they've had less time and started their careers with less access to quality investment information than younger generations to save up on their own. I think it's really interesting. There is certainly a cohort of us, uh, particularly for you older Xers, that maybe went out into the workplace expecting a pension. I know that in my particular location at work, um, there's a overarching kind of organization that oversees multiple locations, as is many of the case. I, I don't get into my work here, but um, the larger organization decided that they were going to eliminate the pension and divest out and then allow the individual locations the ability to create their own self-funded 401 or 403B plans. And I will admit there are a lot of people who are like, I don't want to take it out of the pension. Like, what do you mean it's going to be gone? But so many of these pension funds had these unfunded liabilities. It was going to be probably impossible, particularly in the the mid early 2000s. It was just not going to end well for some of these plans. However, I will say there's a lot of gloom and doom when it comes to this stuff. Bear in mind, this is a, a long term deal. Um, and I've mentioned before particularly for those who are my age. So some of you you older Xers might be like, I, I, I wish that applied to me. My father-in-law once told me, and I've said it on the podcast before, he said, look, your, your focus is your kids right now. Get them up, grown, college, off. You will make most of your money after they're up and out of the house. 
because all of your time, energy, effort, and money is going into them. And for those of us who have put our kids in private school, it's an investment that is happening in real time. You're seeing it. There is there is no recompense for us, for the parents who choose to do that. And that's when all the money is going to happen. And, and he insists on it. He goes, because you're going to have more opportunities to be entrepreneurial when you don't have some of these. And I'm not saying the children are weights per se, but there are certainly constraints in early to mid childhood rearing you know, it's it's difficult unless you make the decision to be a absent parent. And that's often the case where one of the two parents, oftentimes the father, is just work, 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 work all the time, every day, all day, every day. And that is a, a decision that certainly some people have made. And that is your decision to make. If you still have strong relationships with your kids, awesome. And I think that there are people who are capable of doing that. I wanted to be active and around in a way as much as I could. So those three years that I spent on the other side of the state were very, very difficult, not just for them, but also for me. So I didn't make that decision. But do I hope that I can get my health back on straight? I got a few more years of high school and for the, the, you know, the kids and they're off to college and then they're on their own. But even if they came back to live at home, there are these regular expenses that are no longer there, and that can be focused in other ways, whether it's paying down any kind of existing debt or putting it down more towards your mortgage or just going ahead and putting more into your retirement plan, which I believe for this next year with the catch-up contribution that you can get once you reach a certain age, it's like 30 grand or something like that. So, and for those of you who haven't done anything, you can now, and it's hard, but honestly, you can do it. It's a short time period. For those of you who are in the older X who are bumping up against retirement age, you have way less time to do it. I totally get it. You feel like you can't retire. I get it. You might not be able to. Social security may not be enough, but try to get some money put away if you can, or you've just planned on having your one investment being your home. Okay. When the time comes, you sell that, that funds a big piece of it. If you've paid down most of the mortgage and you're getting almost all the proceeds from the sale of your home. Um, but anyway, uh, what else is in here? Um, baby boomers more likely to experience the early portion of that transition when the understanding of how to use a DC were not as developed as they are now. Um, Morningstar's research assumes that Social Security payments will not change something that isn't 100% guaranteed in the U.S.'s current policy environment. As the report notes, the program cleats creeps closer to insolvency each year, which could greatly affect retirement outcomes for most generations. So for those of you who don't know, the original plan for Social Security was not to necessarily be permanent. It did have a time limit, and then it's just continued on. We're not going to get into the political aspects of it and how it becomes a very motivating tool uh, used by both parties to use as leverage. And it just sucks because... Just It just does, because if it becomes insolvent, where is everything that I've paid into it gone? Or all of us have paid into it gone. It's been a piggy bank. It's been a slush fund. It's been a lot of things, and it's not really fair. But anyway, it's never too late. Never too late. So now for a completely different topic, I got to thinking, and I said to myself, self, talked about actors and actresses and all that and i may have even done this before but i don't think i've i've done it this way which is who really owns the box office and i said to myself self i think gen x rules the box office in fact i know it so with very few exceptions, and let me just take a look at one of them here real quick, because I'm not quite sure where this person falls. Uh, let's see. So for the most part, with the exception of four, let's see. Yeah, I think with the exception of four, 
for millennials or younger, everyone else is either firmly Gen X or on the cusp, with a couple of notable exceptions. As far as top grossing actors, actresses, they don't use actor and actresses anymore, I guess. They only do for awards, apparently. So I think everyone knows who number one is. Now, part of this is just by virtue of, like, being in a lot of stuff, but also having to have excellent decision-making instincts. So the highest growing act, uh, grossing actor of all time is one Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson, highest grossing of all time. But I mean, you just could go through the list of movies. And even when he was still up and coming, these movies that were these minor hits, but was still getting him in front of the audience and then getting into these bigger blockbusters. I mean, holy cow. I mean, it's crazy to think about it between being in Star Wars and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, and The Incredibles, one and two. He was in a Die Hard. I, then then the M. Night Shyamalan series with Unbreakable, um, Glass, and uh, what was the last one? No, it's... Uh, Unbreakable. Oh, he wasn't in Split, but that's the the trilogy there. Um, Snakes on a Plane was still a hit. He was in a Kingsman. Uh, Jackie Brown, Kill Bill, Django Unchained, Hateful Eight, of course, Pulp Fiction. And, you know, all of his up and coming fame was a lot of Spike Lee joints. I mean, it's crazy. So anyway, but he is a boomer. Robert Downey Jr. is next. Also, Marvel Cinematic Universe. So maybe this is skewed and I need to just take out Marvel. But Robert Downey Jr., 1965, one of ours, started out being tangential to the Brat Pack. Two episodes on the Brat Pack. Go check it out in the archives. And here he is with multiple franchises here as well. Because it's not just... Marvel necessarily, because he's also did the Sherlock Holmes movies, which I know weren't like huge, but he's got other stuff in there. Oh, and Oppenheimer. He's in that, too. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. Next, the last year of Gen X on most measurements is this guy. Again, a little bit of Marvel, but also, I don't know, some Jurassic World and some Lego. Chris Pratt is number three all time. I personally am a fan of Chris Pratt. I know he gets some hate online because of whatever people perceive him to be. He's a Christian. He's a patriot. He's a hunter. I really like to show Terminalist bleak as hell, but I thought it was great and a kind of a a showing of some of his range. But bear in mind, I'm a fan of Chris Pratt going all the way back to Everwood. I've mentioned before, my wife and I flirted briefly with the name Brighton, Bright, from everyone so chris pratt good dude first millennial on the list scarlett johansson again mostly marvel mostly marvel not that she hasn't done other stuff but as far as like huge blockbusters what other huge blockbusters has she been in um scarlett which is the name of our dog who we call a scarlett johansson eck um, oh, Ghost World. I like that stupid movie. I really did. Um, let's see. What is her main filmography? Blockbuster films and critical acclaim. Yeah, I mean, she was in everything. She was in Winter Soldier. Um, let's see. I don't even remember this. Chef alongside Robert Downey Jr. Oh, and, and John Favreau. It grossed over $45 million at the box office and well received by critics. Uh, Lucy. I haven't seen Lucy. I remember that being kind of a hit as well. Uh, the film grossed $458 million on a budget of $40 million to become the 18th highest grossing film of 2014. I was wrong. I don't remember Lucy being massive, but apparently it was. 
Luke Besson. What a strange dude. Um, let's see. Oh, voice work. Yeah. Holy cow. Um, I know she did the Ghost in the Shell adaptation. Let's see. Then it's like, oh, more Infinity War. End game. Oh, she was in Marriage Story. I heard that's really, really intense. Really intense. Somehow, Taika Waititi got her to be in Jojo Rabbit. Um, yeah, so anyway. Uh, but she is a millennial and the first one on the list. So next, Boomer, Mr. Tom Hanks. I don't have much to say about him. Next, we have Gen X, Zoe Saldana. Zoe Zaldana. Um, so, I mean, she was in Mission Impossible. She was in Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Was she also in A yeah, Avatar? Avatar. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, holy cow. Yeah, I mean, these are some major, major franchises. She has starred in four of the highest grossing films of all time with Avatar, Avatar Way of Water, Avengers Infinity War, and Avengers Endgame. Not to mention the fact that the Guardians of the Galaxy movies were also huge hits. She was also in Star Trek, uh, playing Uhura. Yeah, crazy. Crazy. And next we have... Oh, this guy, I always forget. Because I feel like he is right on... Yeah, he's right on the cusp. So... He is one of the the older tangential brat packers in Mr. Tom Cruise, born in 1962. But I don't think we need to get into his body of work, do we? Next, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper is firmly Gen X, and he is at this point, I, I think, uh, so born in 1975. He's kind of done it all at this point um nominated for 12 academy awards six golden globes and a tony award so i mean i don't know does he ever get the he got i don't know if he'll ever win any of these awards what has he won anything a list of awards and nominations what have we here always nominated never the winner sorry bro sorry bro but nevertheless uh, he's done okay at the box office. Next, a millennial, a millennial in Chris Hemsworth. Uh, just uh, mentioned a couple episodes ago, my son and I watched uh, the first Extraction movie. I don't know. I, I think he's he's such a fun actor. People want to say that he's one note, but I think he's given some some really great performances i think that thor was way more nuanced than people give him credit for but i kind of like the stuff he's in oh i'm really embarrassed to say this i never got to go see furiosa in the movie theater i'm probably gonna watch it this weekend at home i'm bummed but anyway uh next definitely not a boomer harrison ford do i need to go over the credentials it's gonna go up again too because he's gonna be in more marvel shit uh chris evans Chris Evans, uh, he is, he was the one I looked up, and then I just forgot what I just looked up a little while ago. Uh, yeah, he is a millennial. He is a millennial, so he does not count, but we know what he's been in. Oh, this next guy is is almost, he, he's almost, I don't know, in some ways, <laughs> like the Gen X actor in a lot of ways. And I think you'll know what I mean when I say this. Vin Diesel is so one of ours. His sensibilities, all of it. He, just. I I have mentioned before, guiltiest of guilty, guilty pleasures, not even guilty. I love the Riddick series. All of it. Pitch Black, Chronicles of Riddick, Riddick. Love it. Love it. Love it. I've only watched a, a, a random Fast and Furious here and there, but, you know, pretty good. Um, I liked Triple X. I know he came back. I didn't see, like, the return of Xander Cage. I think I'll probably just, you know, 
who knows, maybe if when I'm recovering from surgery, I'll just need to watch some movies and I'll do that. Um, no, what I'm supposed to say is I'm not going to have surgery. Yeah. Positive thinking, positive thinking. Um, but he was in saving private Ryan. And then the pacifier is such a fun family action movie. And I don't know if you don't like him, that's on you, bro. That is on you. Um, next we have Johnny Depp. Now Johnny Depp is a cusp. He's 1963. So sorry, but that's all almost all, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Will Smith, he's one of ours and gradually became a massive movie star. Then kind of took some stumbling blocks, then kind of came out of it. But on the night that he won the biggest award in Hollywood, he, uh, set himself back again. But we all know Will Smith's bona fides. Next, another Gen Xer indeed. We have Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He has just churned out movie of a movie of a movie, and I, people will say something underperforms, and it's still usually pretty decent box office. So, really can't dispute that. Next, oh, you know what? He's just outside, I think. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a boomer. 1961, we have Eddie Murphy. I have not watched the new Beverly Hills Cop. I'm going to check that out. Um, next, we have Tom Holland. I mean, gosh, I mean, he's a millennial. He's a young millennial. Uh, Gen X's own, rounding out the bottom three, I think. Hold on here. Yes, so we have... Mark, excuse me, Matt Damon, Mark Ruffalo, and Don Cheadle rounding out the list. So really what it comes down to is for most of the list, it's Gen X. And they continue to be drivers of cinema. So I guess it's one of those things that everything I talk about on the show about where you are in time and space, where we are right now in our lives, we're outside of the 18, well, most of us. Eh, you still got a few years, I guess. Because my wife is is Gen X, and she's three years younger, so she's still got a ways in her 40s to go. So she's still in the 18 to 49 demographic. I'm now officially in a different marketing demographic. Gosh. Oh, brutal. Uh, but nevertheless, Gen X, we are the top of the box office. Part of it is time and space where we are with with movies having become what they've become and the the billions of dollars that they generate. But I'd be curious to see this list 20 years ago. I mean, a few of them would still be on there, but I wonder who would be in the top spot. Samuel Jackson, probably still at that point, right? 20 years ago, 2000, excuse me, 2004, um, 20 years ago. Yeah. I'd be curious to look at that. And where would Tom Cruise be in that? Tom Hanks would probably been at the top of the list. I think back then, Anyway, top grossing actors, most are Gen X. So next, this is a completely random thing. Um, I just wanted to share with you that Corey Feldman, Gen X icon, child actor, teen star, young heartthrob, into a conflicted, perhaps slightly damaged adult, working on the periphery of Hollywood, yet still churning out movies, albeit very, very indie, supposedly a pariah from the Hollywood inner circle because of his vocal protestations on the conditions for young people in Hollywood in what he says is a pedophile's dream regardless of any of that he keeps on plugging away and if you ever want to see something um he has a, a music video it's been out for about a month now called the joke directed by none other than the lead biscuit himself fred 
Durst. Just check it out is all I can say. There's actually a surprising kind of bridge in the song that I was surprised by going, this part is actually quite good. I I don't know that I would put it on any of my playlists, but if you're looking for a little bit of a guilty pleasure, check it out. Fred Durst, Corey Feldman, The Joke. Available on YouTube or wherever you listen to music. It, it's something. Um, so then I just thought I would share, because I like to do concert episodes, but I haven't gotten any concerts. I have been to stand up, of course, is looking at some of the most anticipated tours of this year, some of which are still running. Um, a couple of them actually have been canceled. It turns out that the, uh, Fuji's reunion tour with, um, Lauren Hill, most of the dates have been canceled, but Alanis Morissette, that wraps up this week. Um, there's a festival. It might have already happened, but if you wanted to check that out, you certainly could. Uh, for those of you who are in California, it looks as though you have the next week, next week, all this week, she'll be in California before heading to a date in Jacksonville, Florida, only to come back to California for a number of dates, rounding out her tour. We have Andre 3000. Now, honestly, I don't know if it's all flute music or not. So for those of you who don't know, he's really rocking the flute. But he's in L.A., Dallas, a bunch of dates in Dallas coming up. New Mexico, Arizona, and all up through California into the Pacific Northwest before heading back down to Utah and then making his way across the Midwest before he comes out here to the East Coast in October. We have Bikini Kill, punk rock icons of our generation. Uh, Let's see. Um, All of these are West Coast dates before again jumping into the Midwest through Wisconsin and Illinois before heading up to Maine, making their way down through New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and then heading to Canada. No Boston date. Interesting. Let's see. I'm going to save this one for last. I'm going to come back to this. Um, For those of you who were into Bright Eyes, by the way, um, just bear in mind, a kind of a short tour, Chicago, Omaha, Oakland, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. Um, For those of you who don't know, Connor Oberst, uh, Bright Eyes, coming up on Saddle Creek Records. If you're interested, my sister-in-law, Katie Burns, uh, recorded with the folks from Saddle Creek, and uh, her music can be found wherever you get your music, Apple Music, Spotify, but Katie Burns Music, go ahead and check it out. Not my particular cup of tea. She knows this, Um, you know, so I'm not saying anything disrespectful. Just not for me. But uh, for those of you who are into that style of music, which is kind of a folky rock, very, very 90s, very 90s, early 2000s, very much in that kind of Midwest Saddle Creek vibe. I recommend you check it out. Let's see. Um, Who else? From old Gen X was out on tour. Let's see. I mean, there's been a a ton, but I'm trying to focus on the ones that I think might be of interest. I know that Cindy Lauper was just doing a tour where she is wrapping things up. Let's see. October 26th. She's going to be in Boston. I might need to go see that show. October 26th. Man, I hope it's not the wedding we're supposed to go to. MGM Music Hall. Am I buying tickets while I'm on the podcast right now? Maybe. I'm just curious to see what kind of tickets are left. Holy cow. Yup, it is definitely uh, her final tour. Holy cow. Thousands of dollars for tickets. She deserves it. 
she's a legend. She's an icon going out in her own terms. I don't think I'm making that show unless the aftermarket tickets are way cheaper. Uh, Green Day's on tour with Smashing Pumpkins, Rancid, and the Linda Lindas. I think I've talked about that tour before. You can go check that out. Jane's Addiction is on a reunion tour. This one I might want to check out. Um, it looks as though they're they're in California right now, headed through Texas, kind of taking the, many of them are, are taking the same kind of journey, but they're definitely going down south, going through Oklahoma, uh, Louisiana, Florida, and then making their way up the coast that way. I mean, this is like a proper, a proper tour. And they're going to be here in Boston at the Leader Bank Pavilion, September 13th. And they're going to be heading to Bridgeport, Connecticut, the Hartford Healthcare Amphitheater on September 15th for my Massachusetts and Connecticut peeps. And then they're making their way back slightly through the Midwest before wrapping things up in the States in Missouri. Um, yeah, in Missouri. Let's see. Janet Jackson's on tour. Another one uh, of a Gen X icon. And let's see. Oh, these are all international dates. So for those of you who are in France and Great Britain and so on, check them out. Doesn't look like anything in the States. And Jesus and Mary Chain, the psychedelic furs are on tour. Um, anything else interesting here? Anyway, number of great tours this year. I just missed Metallica coming through this way. I just knew I wasn't going to get tickets. Um, oh, here's one that I, I I might try to get tickets to. Also come to the MGM um, here in Boston. But this is coming up in like a week, and I just don't know if I'm going to be up for it, to be perfectly honest. And that is an evening with PJ Harvey. These tickets are way easier to get. Um, but PJ Harvey on tour, I've seen her live. She's excellent. Check her out if you can. And Tom York is playing some solo gigs. It looks like these are all in New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, and Japan. So if you're in any of those areas, you can see him. And that is it. Well, I guess he's Gen X too. Usher, past, present, and future tour. And he is in Georgia now, heading to D.C., coming up here to the Boston Garden, doing two nights at the Garden for heading to Philly, and then doing a three-night, uh, four nights in Brooklyn at the Barclays Center. So good for you, Usher. Good for you. All right. So then finally, the band that I mentioned is on tour. Now, a friend of the show, Carlos, has just recently seen them live, and they kick off their set with uh, one of my summertime uh, summertime playlist songs. Um, you'll have to go check it out and know what it is. You can find that on Spotify, which is my Stuck Middle Podcast summer playlist. You can find it also on the episode Summer Songs, and you can get to the playlist that way. Now, I'm talking, of course, about a band called Blink-182. And anyone who's read the news would have seen this potentially funny headline. Because a reviewer stated that... Let me get the exact headline. Because I'm reading the article that is kind of a... Um, a rebuttal, if you will. Um... <laughs> I remember when I saw this pop up and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is happening here? So the headline is um, Blink-182's performance distastefully clo closes Lollapalooza. Now, this is written by a young lady by the name of Ella Narag. The special sections editor, this was posted on August 5th, 2024, and her opening sentence is cringeworthy and repulsive. Blink-182's headlining performance was unworthy of closing out this year's Lollapalooza. So, 
I'm not sure if you're familiar with Blink-182. However, they have lyrics that state, um, <laughs> called her mom from a payphone. I said this was the cops. Your husband's in jail. The state looks down on sodomy. And that's when this bitch hung up on me. I, I mean, it's it's Blink-182. Like, what do you mean? So let me get into it. So Tom DeLonge has made light of the harsh review of Blink-182's recent show at Lollapalooza, which called the band cringeworthy. The review of the set from over the weekend was shared by local outlet, The Daily Island Eye, which shared a pretty negative take on the headline slot at the Chicago Music Festival. As I mentioned, in the piece, the journalist began by calling the set cringeworthy and repulsive, as well as unworthy. They also took issue with crude sense of humor the musicians integrate into their performances. Why are two older men, aged 52 and 48 respectively, who have wives and children, making jokes about sleeping with the other's mother? The crude humor may have landed with some, but to continue throughout the hour and 15 minute long set was a bit much. Okay, so first of all, you don't understand male relationships and male friendships. Because if you have become friends with someone, particularly when you're younger, mamas are not off the table. For joking or sisters or anything. Dude, it's not off the table. Okay? So the fact that these two men who have known each other like most of their lives joke in this way is actually pretty normal, particularly for a band who writes crude dick and fart joke songs. They also made note of how Bands Mark, the band's Mark Hoppus at one point delivered a smutty innuendo when discussing Chicago's infamous Bean Landmark and added, unfortunately, their songs, lyrics, and stage presence were not enough to make up for their excessively crude commentary. They're like a kick-ass live band. Stop. Stop. Now frontman and guitarist Tom DeLonge has taken the comments in his stride, shared a snippet of the review online to make light of the criticism. And he posts, Ha 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 ha, Blake with 82. Why are two men who have had wives and kids making jokes about sleeping with each other's mothers? Oh my God, I'm dying. Ha ha ha, fuck. I love this band. Do you really think that was gonna bother them? Fans were quick to side with the musician, with many calling out the reviewer for not having a sense of humor when it comes to the members' whole shtick as a band. Tell us you've never listened to Blink-182 without telling me you've never listened to Blink. One wrote, while Hoppus' wife, Sky, commented, dying, love this so much. And Sam Carter, frontman of Architects, replied with a string of laughing emojis, while filmmaker and photographer Rory Kramer wrote, it wouldn't be a Blink show without some crude humor. I mean, I gotta say, if you want to be completely tone deaf to who the band is, I mean, come on, man. Wrong band for that. That's just the wrong band for that. And I'm just wondering if that same reviewer would go to, I don't know, I'm just going to use them as an example because they've been punching bags in the news, a Tenacious D show, and say, oh my gosh, that's inappropriate. Really? Like, this person has no sense of humor. Now, not to, to talk down at her, but she's a sophomore in college and maybe thought that she was being, like, noble or saying, well, why is it? Uh, the jokes didn't land for you. And admittedly, the jokes are probably just not for you. And that's okay. And you have every right to go ahead and write whatever review that you want, positive or negative. That is your right. You went there to review the show. You found Blink-182 a band built on distasteful humor, a lot of nudity in their early years. It's just a strange hill to die on because that's just not the band to call out for sophomoric behavior. It's just really not. It's weird. It's a weird choice. 
Anyway, that is another Whatever Wednesday and whatever just popped into my head and I found of interest this week. So, I'd love to know your thoughts. And if you are one of those people who might be interested in having a chance to maybe be on the show, because you are already podcasters, and why not join forces? Take over the universe. Anyway, how can you let me know what you think of the episode, what you think of the show, and maybe whatever you think about the show moving forward? I'm always happy to hear it. Love your suggestions. Love your comments. Keep them coming. And how do you do that? You can email me at stuckinthemiddlepod at yahoo.com. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, X, and YouTube at StuckPodX. Head on over to the Facebook page, Stuck in the Middle, a Gen X podcast. Please like, comment, share, leave five-star reviews, and most importantly, please subscribe to the podcast. So until next time, later, slackers. Thank you.